Ohio Gun Group has raised more than $12,000 so Zimmerman can buy himself another gun. On the grill tonight, the man who's helped raise all that cash, Ken Hansen, he's the legal chairman of the Buckeye Firearms Foundation. Mr. Hansen, welcome to you. Why do you want Jules Zimmerman to have a, a gun so badly? Well, I mean, the first thing to point out is the purpose of the fundraiser was not just to buy a gun. It was to buy gun, gear, ammunition, training, um, security systems, uh, personal protection, whatever he felt was appropriate to defend himself, defend his family, defend his parents. Uh, and, and that was what the money was raised for. Have you offered to do the same for the family of Trayvon Martin, given it was obviously their unarmed teenage son? who was shot dead by Jules Zimmerman. Have you thought about their security going forward? Uh, I'm not aware of any threats against Mr. Martin's family uh, for the fact that uh, Mr. Zimmerman was acquitted. If there are people threatening his family, uh, certainly with African Americans up in Cleveland, uh, lawmakers up in Cleveland that have been going through threats after they uh, were involved in court cases, we've stepped up to the plate and provided those people with resources also. Right, you get my point, is that obviously they lost their teenage son who was unarmed to a gun, a gun that was owned by George Zimmerman. Uh, many people would feel the last thing George Zimmerman should be having right now is another gun. Well, but the point is, two different levels of government review, the initial police review, the initial prosecution review, and then second, a jury trial with a hand-picked prosecutor that didn't even go through a grand jury, acquitted Mr. Zimmerman of those charges. Right, but what if he does it again? What if Trayvon Martin's older brother is walking in the same area in a few months' time, George Zimmerman happens to be passing, finds him suspicious again, as he did Trayvon, decides to engage him uh, in the street and decides to shoot him as well. Where, where does that leave you if you're the one that supplied the gun? Well, if we're the ones uh, that supplied the gun, and again, remember, we, we provided money, not a gun, uh, but if someone is on top of Mr. Zimmerman, again, repeatedly bashing his head into the concrete, uh, and he acts in self-defense, that's incredible bad luck that he found himself in that situation twice. Uh, but we'll sleep soundly. You would sleep soundly if you did it again? Uh, if he's acting legally in self-defense again, absolutely. And at what point does he have to take responsibility for not pursuing, some would say stalking, unarmed teenagers who are walking home? Well, again, two different levels of government review have found no fault with Mr. Zimmerman's actions. No, I'm, asking you, I'm, asking point, you you, I'm asking you if you do, if you think at any point he has any responsibility for his own actions. In other words, if you're going to arm this guy again, give him a gun that he's recently used a gun to shoot an unarmed teenager, if you're going to arm him again, and that's what you've actively done, you've raised $12,000 with your group to deliberately arm him, as you say, with guns, with ammunition, security, and so on, that's fine, but what if he then does it again? Well, I mean, we can go through all the hypotheticals that you'd like to go through, but what it comes down to is if he's gone through a government review again in the second hypothetical situation that you're raising, uh, then he acted within the law, and uh, I just don't see why that's a problem. I think that I would, if I lived in that area and I had a, you know, particularly if I was a, a black family, who had a son like Trayvon Martin, maybe age 16, 17, 18, who liked to wear hoodies, I'd be pretty nervous at the thought of George Zimmerman walking around with another gun. And I think they would be right to feel nervous. Well, the problem is when we go out and help uh, the Pink Pistols, a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender group who's being discriminated against denied their gun rights. When we go up uh, to a young African-American male up in Cleveland who was wearing a hoodie who act, had to act in self-defense, when we go up to Cleveland for an elected legislator who acted, voted against every single piece of pro-gun legislation that was introduced in the Ohio General Assembly, when we're acting on behalf of those people, it's not a problem. It's only in this case when the villagers have gone out with the torches and the pitchforks that it somehow becomes a problem. Uh, this is not an issue of, of race. 
race, it's an issue of self-defense law. And your hypothetical second situation, I mean, God forbid it happens. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't ever happen to anyone. Uh, but if they go through that same level of review, of review again and it's found self-defense, then that's the law. What is your view of Florida's uh, stand your ground law and indeed a law that many other states have embraced? Well, the United States did not have a duty to retreat in its laws uh, in, in most states until the 1920s and 1930s. And I think it's important for people to understand that whether we're talking duty to retreat, stand your ground, or whatever, that doesn't arise until the lethal physical contra confrontation already has occurred. Mr. Zimmerman was not standing his ground. The evidence shows he was laying on the ground and having his head bashed into the concrete. Right, but I asked you what your view of the stand your ground law was, not, not about George Zimmerman. Well, again, the United States did not have a duty to retreat in its laws until the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, we looked at it extensively in many court cases throughout the United States, and it's only then that some states start to introduce uh, a, a duty to retreat. And at the point that someone's on top of you pummeling you into the ground, there's no option to retreat. So whether it's stand your ground or whether it's a state that doesn't have stand your ground and has a duty to retreat, it just doesn't make a difference. So just to clarify, you don't think there should ever really be any situation where you have a duty to retreat? Oh, the taking of a human life is a last resort, morally, religiously, ethically, uh, and legally. And whether there's a duty to retreat or not, the first step in a self-defense test is always, do you have an alternative way out of the situation? It could be pressing an alarm button. It could be using a taser. It could be using pepper spray, anything like that. It's not a physical retreat that is key. That's always the first step in a self-defense case is can you avoid the taking of the human life? Have you ever thought that you could reduce the taking of human lives if you reduce the number of guns? Has that thought process ever crossed your mind? Oh, certainly as a prosecutor uh, for over 12 years, as someone who has been court-appointed counsel in murders, rapes, kidnappings, uh, that thought has crossed my mind, and I have not ever found the number of words put down on a, police, on a piece of paper that saves a human life. What do you mean by that? Uh, you can write all the laws you want down on a piece of paper. Uh, the criminals are still going to get the guns. We've seen that repeatedly. The United States did a national experiment with magazine bans, uh, certain ugly rifle bans, things like that. It had no impact on crime. Well, actually, uh, actually know, that's not true, though, is it? Illegal. Because it, in the last assault weapons ban, there was a 7.5% drop in, in gun deaths. So that's not true. Uh, no. No, actually, I don't think that's true. The, no, that, that the, is the true. conclusion presented to Congress was that there was no reputable academic study that showed it had any impact on crime. What about all the countries that brought in tough gun control laws like uh, Great Britain, like Australia, uh, Japan and others, where they have incredibly low numbers of gun deaths because they have very strong gun control? How do you explain that if your theory is it makes no difference? Countries are uh, based upon the culture of the country. We cannot begin to examine uh, the United States versus Japan, for instance, where they have a cultural heritage of expecting to be caught, uh, expecting to confess, things like that. Uh, the, the, the idea that you can compare the United States to some other country's gun laws is just been so thoroughly debunked in the literature uh, that I don't know how to respond to it. No, you're right. Words fail me too. Uh, very good to talk to you, Ken Hanson. Thank you very much.